לראשונה בישראל מעולם לא דיבר עם אף ערוץ תקשורת ישראלי, תום לי. ואתם יודעים מה? מי אני שיציג אותו? בואו ניתן לשדרנים של CNBC להציג אותו. I might as well call you Mr. All In. Let's bring in Tom Lee now, co-founder of Fundstrat, Global Advisors, and a CNBC contributor for more on the market. Tom. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining another episode of Micah Stocks. And today we have, I believe, the the best. most brilliant person in the stock market today. We follow his predictions. We talk about him endlessly. And I know you've been waiting for me to have Tom Lee. So Tom Lee, Fondstrat Managing Partner is joining us today. Tom, welcome. Thanks. So Tom, I don't know if you know, my viewers love your thought process, your predictions, whether it's on the stock market, whether it's on the energy sector, whether it's... You know, a lot of things, and I try to share most, I can't say all, but most of your comments. So before we even start kind of diving in, the, the ones that don't know who Tom Lee is, can you give us 60, 90 seconds about you, your background, how you got to where you are today? Uh, yeah, glad to. Uh, my name's Tom Lee, and I'm based in New York City. Uh, I am the co-founder and head of research for Fundstrat. Global Advisors, and we have a service for individuals called FS Insight. Uh, I've been doing research since 1993 uh, on equity, so this is my, nearly my 30th year. And uh, the first half of my career, I, I was a technology analyst covering the wireless industry, um, and then uh, including some, you know, spent some time with companies like Elbit uh, back mm -hmm. in those days. And then uh, for the last, you know, 15 to 20 years, I've been uh, doing equity strategy. And prior to founding this company, I was the head of chief equity strategist for JP Morgan. The same JP Morgan where we're going to talk about regarding crypto and later, mm -hmm. later this conversation. Yeah. So it sounds ridiculous asking this question now uh, because we're after or during crypto. Two days of a huge rally in the market but I think a week ago two weeks ago you upgraded your uh, 4700 target for the S&P to 4800 which was a question I wanted to ask you actually earlier this week when everything was a bit reddish now when everything is green everyone thinks it's gonna go there but mm -hmm. let's go back to the reasoning because I believe once we'll understand the reasoning even if we'll see a, a pullback which I believe we might see in the next few days but that's my you Uh, thought process. I'd love to hear from you. Why did you upgrade the 47 to 48? And of what are the, you believe, the areas that are going to push that forward? Uh, yeah, glad to talk about this. Um, you know, uh, I think that there's, if I had to sort of list in order, I think there's like four or five things that are supporting stocks for the next eight weeks. And, you know, obviously, and even beyond that, um, The first is, I think the general environment is improving, especially around COVID in the US and you know, places like UK and Israel, we've already seen the Delta surge uh, reach its peak and then essentially dissipate. Yeah. Um, the second is there's growing evidence and a lot of sustained evidence that there's a lot of pent up demand in the US. And that's a great thing because if people have been hesitant and as the, as the risks fade, Uh, spending should really recover and that's what we're seeing uh, the third reason is I think profit revisions are still going to be higher in the S&P you know I was just looking at next year's earnings and consensus is looking for like something like five or six percent earnings growth next year which is uh, you know I mean that's just inflation um, yeah. so I mean I think earnings have a lot of room to rise and And we have a seasonal strong period coming um, in the final week. So uh, I think stocks are now beginning to rally because people were so bearish. And so I don't, you know, I think we could easily exceed 4,800, but 4,800, I think is a safe number. 
And you know, I didn't, I didn't plan of asking that, but I, I saw you, I think two, three weeks ago on a convention in Vegas where you were with Market Rebellion. And if I remember correctly, you talked about the money on the sidelines, the, the same money that we call the bearish money that everyone was afraid that everything's going to crash and they held the money out there. Do you believe that's part of that? The fact that money is going to flow in and going to basically create that tide that all boats would go up? Uh, yeah, there's still a lot of money on the sidelines. A uh, little, you know, some money I'm sure has been put to work recently, but there was panic selling over the last eight weeks because of, uh, you know, all the turmoil in stocks, especially in September. Yeah. And there's a tendency for people to go to all cash. Uh, I don't know exactly why. So people <laughs> panic sell. And I know that a lot of large pension funds and family offices are sort of bearish. And so they've been waiting for a larger correction. And then as you get into the end of the year, now we have two months left and October was supposed to be the crash. If it doesn't happen now, all of a sudden people got to put money to work. Talking about money to work, um, following Fundstrat's work. And of course, through the retail investor portion of it, which I'll share later on uh, how your website looks and things like that. You have a few sectors that you and your team, of course, Um, kind of mapped out and focuses that you believe the year-end rally would benefit these sectors. And I'm sure my viewers would love to hear about these sectors. And if you have a few companies that you believe in these sectors would shine even more, that would be amazing. And I remind everyone, this is not financial advice. Anything we share here is educational. You need to do your own due diligence. Okay, we did that disclaimer. Now we can continue the, the regular conversa conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I can tell you what I like. It doesn't mean that's what investors should do. Um, uh, the, the three sectors that we like into the end of the year, and we've been highlighting them, uh, are energy FANG, which is basically large cap tech mm -hmm. and financials. And, but it's for three essentially different reasons. You know, energy to us is still one of the least liked sector. So it's the one group that many institutions actually don't want to have any exposure to because they think ESG and green and oil, people aren't going to use oil anymore. But the reality is, is that oil is an extremely tight market with a lot of upside pressure because there's no production coming. Yeah. And energy stocks are very cheap relative to oil. So even though energy is up 55% year to date, I, I think in the next year, it could still go up another 50% uh, or more. Um, we like tech, large cap tech FANG, you know, which is the acronym. Yeah. Uh, the reason we like tech is that number one, it's derated this year, which means the PE contracted. Um, they're holding out fine. In fact, you know, they're prospering even with this reopening and they're a great hedge against inflationary pressures because they don't have any margin pressure from inflation. So I think that this is a group that as people start putting money to work, they're going to put it into FANG. That's why it's really rallying. It's almost a sign that pensions are putting money to work. And then the third group um, we like is financials and uh, financials, It's really a reopening thesis because credit demand uh, drives financials. And, you know, as Delta risk fade and as the supply chain glitches fade and people start resuming construction and other durable good activities, that's tailwind for financials. So that, that's very interesting because one sector that I didn't hear you mention is the, I'm not even sure it's a sector or more of an area, which is the crypto. And you've oh. been a huge crypto bull. Um, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, people like to go back to your videos from 2017 or 2018 and show you, yeah. oh, here you missed a bit. But at the end of the day, anyone who bought Bitcoin at 2015, 16, even 17, 18, 19 is well in the money. So what's your prediction there? What's your thought on crypto to all the ones that are still not exposed or maybe limited exposure? What are your thoughts there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think everybody should own some crypto. I mean, even if someone's, you know, 60, 70 and retired or someone's 18, uh, because one, it's, it's really going to be the next big avenue for where innovation takes place. And as you know, I mean, you know, last hundred years, a lot of opportunity and money is made buying, being in the right space where there's a lot of growth and that's crypto. Bitcoin, uh, 
is super important because it is a truly secure network, a really one of the few ways in the world to actually do uh, have a hundred percent trust with anonymous, completely unknown credentials of the counterparties. You know, it's, it's, it cannot be done today in the financial system this way, unless you're carrying dollars. So, I mean, Bitcoin is basically more secure than dollars that way. Um, and yeah, we're, we're bullish because, you know, one thing is, you know, Bitcoin makes all of its gains in 10 days in a year. So I don't think people should buy this and then expect to be rich in two weeks. They really need to be what they call hodling, uh, you know, and, and that just means don't just buy it and forget about it. And, uh, you know, this year, Bitcoin's up, you know, 150 percent, but next year it could do even better. So I, I think, you know, it's still a good opportunity. I just don't refer to it as a sector because it's, it's really a separate asset class. Do you, with that prediction of seeing Bitcoin in a, and, you know, we have different predictions year end, 100, 130, 36, maybe go to Kathy Wood's prediction in the next 12 or, or 24 months, 250, whatever the prediction is, which companies do you believe would benefit? Because you mentioned financials, financials currently, and that's why we joked about uh, JP Morgan. You know, Jamie Dimon has a clear uh, value of Bitcoin, although his uh advisors say otherwise he says zero so which financials or which companies do you believe are going to really enjoy the the boom and on the crypto market or in the crypto market uh yeah it's a great question i mean you know uh crypto is disrupting financial services so within financial services there'll be winners and losers but it's not correct for people to think all financial companies are going to lose i mean microsoft and Walmart, let's say, are the two companies most disrupted by the internet um, because, you know, uh, I mean, cloud essentially disrupted Microsoft's monopoly PC yeah. model. But look at Microsoft's stock. It's been a great stock yeah. because they pivoted. And same thing with Walmart. Uh, I, I have no doubt that companies like JP Morgan and Goldman will pivot. Um, so they will capitalize on crypto. But if someone wanted to be betting on the new entrance, which is always smart. Um, there's many ways to get exposure. You know, you can buy the exchanges like Coinbase or Voyager Digital, mm -hmm. um, or you can buy some of the miners like Riot and Mara. Uh, and there's going to be more out there. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get exposure. Yeah, that, that's great. And we cover these companies here on the channel quite often, both uh, the the equity itself around Bitcoin and the miners and everything around that. One company that usually most of my uh, most of my conversations talk about is Tesla. And I haven't he I haven't heard the EV and put aside Tesla for a second. I haven't heard the EV as a hot sector from you. I th I don't even think I have ever heard you talk about the EV sector. Is that something? that you shy away from, uh, you believe it's a bubble. What's your thoughts on the EV sector as a whole? Uh, uh, well, EV is technology and, uh, you know, Tesla is one of our granny shots. So it's a name that we've been recommending to investors for a long time. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, th this is a great example. Tesla is a great example of how people try to put a company in a box and then, when they define the box, they get stubborn and think uh, the company, the stock is is breaking all the rules because it's not staying in the box. I think a lot of people think Tesla is just an auto ma auto maker and they think it should be a low multiple. And it's the same perverse logic people had on Apple stock saying Apple should only be a 10 PE stock because it makes handsets yeah, um, and PCs. It, they're missing the bigger point. I mean, Tesla is is a true network value company because as they grow their base of Tesla owners, uh, that is providing a huge amount of incremental value uh, across that entire, you know, community. I mean, anyone, it, Tesla's are one of the few cars just as a car that I've seen people think is almost magical. As Steve Jobs says, that's, that's how you can really delight a customer. And I, I, I don't hear people talk about, they're German sports cars the same way. I mean, Teslas really do uh, really ex exceed people's expectations. But more importantly, Tesla's uh, share of a consumer's wallet is just is growing. I mean, 
solar is a great example. Um, you know, in a typical house in America, the roof is 10% of the cost of the home. And Tesla and solar roof means Tesla could literally get 10% of the cost of a home as a customer for life. Yeah. Uh, that far exceeds the value that Apple will ever get uh, from its customer or any gaming company. You know, nobody puts 10% of their wallet into Apple. So, I mean, Tesla could easily be the largest stock in the S&P. And it's on, it's on its way there. So, you know, before we wrap things up, I do want to talk about Fundstrat or actually let you talk about Fundstrat. So let me pull up here on the side while we're discussing. This is the FS Insight. So the ones that don't, I, I pulled in, I logged in with my user, uh, Tom, if you, don't, if you can't see. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, so like I mentioned, uh, Tom is, is the managing partner in Fundstrat, which have, let's say, an arm or a vehicle for retail investors like us, like I have a subscription where there's a, every day there's a daily email, covers a lot of things. So Tom, you probably can explain better than me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, what uh, Fundstrat, uh, we founded in 2014. So we've been in business for seven years now. And we originally built it as a firm that was providing uh, very private research to hedge funds. Uh, and, and that business has really been the core. You know, we have about 200 clients in 22 countries and we uh, work with them very closely. And we have, you know, over 24 people at our firm of which 21 do research. So we are essentially the secret research arm of many financial institutions. Yeah. Um, but last year uh, we decided to create a product that non hedge funds can access individuals called FS insight. And that's the website you were showing. And we did it because we wanted to provide the same quality of information to people to, so they can see how we're advising clients. And, and it's much more in depth than what you see on video clips from CNBC or something, because as you know, all on CNBC, all you're going to hear is just 20 seconds of something. I mean, yeah. I'm not very short appearances, but here we explain why you shouldn't be scared of the fed. That's what we did this week. You know, we had a whole piece explaining why the tapering probably could actually cause the stock market to go up. Uh, we've spent a lot of time explaining why inflation isn't as problematic. In fact, you know, for the last month, we've been explaining how the labor market's not as tight as people think. That's why there's really wage inflation should be transitory. That's exactly what the Fed said yesterday. Powell yeah. made the same exact point that the number of people working to total population is super low. That was the, the point we're making that there's still a ton of labor supply out there. So we help explain the world. And I think it keeps people from panic selling. I mean, I'd say that's, and then it helps you identify opportunities like energy. And I think your, your call on the energy was an, an amazing call. I wouldn't have ever, ever thought of talking about energy. We followed your call on OIH and still, I can tell you that when I shared with some of the, some of the people on, on our community and the viewers, that we might have this conversation, conversation, the first thing they said, what does he think about energy now with us? So you answered that at the beginning of the conversation, but because, you know, now you're tied to energy. So anything you, you say about energy, we're going to, we're going to talk about, because you, because you came out and said, guys, energy is where the money is flowing. There's tight demand, there's tight supply, yeah. sorry. And the price is going to go up. This is like buying home builders in 2012 and they worked for nine years. Home builders never rally for nine years and they've been rallying for nine years. Yeah. Energy people forgot as a sector and they haven't owned it for 12 years. Mm -hmm. This is why energy could rally for, you know, five, six years. Things so, like OH, et cetera. Excellent. Tom, I want to really, really thank you. I'm not even sure, you know, I didn't even ask you, have you ever talked to Israeli uh, viewers on, on a channel? on any channel or this is the first time? It's the first time. Um, you know, I've been to, is, to Israel because we actually have some pension clients there and yeah. I cannot tell you who they are, but uh, we'll actually be visiting them again next year. 
Um, so again, our institutional clients, we, we actually never reveal their names, so I yeah. cannot tell you who they are, but, uh, you know, we have four or five institutional clients in Israel. So we'll, you know, so we'll be there and it's a great, it's great to visit. Um, it's a, you know, yeah, it's great. Especially but, try to do that when it's winter here in the East coast, then, then mm, the weather in Israel is amazing. That's for sure. And the yeah. food, of course. So again, thank you very much. Like we say in Hebrew, Todaraba. Thank you very much for, for joining us, for sharing your views. And of course, we're following you, or at least my viewers through me are following you on CNBC. Every, anytime that I get the email on your schedule for the next week, when you're going to be on CNBC, those are slots that I usually record. So we're big yeah. fans of your work. Thank you very much. Um, Great. You know, I, I don't have any more flattering words than the ones I shared with you because we really appreciate it. Uh, for me, it's, it's been you know, a goal getting you on our channel, and I believe the viewers would really love it. So thank you very, very much. Great. Good talking to you, and mm -hmm. have a great thank week. You. Yeah.